Hey y'all, this is Mary McSwain, and I am so excited to introduce to you a new project that we're doing here at the Bucky Kennedy Podcast, and it's going to be a sermon recap. I'm here today with Pastor Bucky, and we're going to be talking about a new series that we're starting in 1 Peter, and it's our sermon yesterday. We were talking about trying to make sense of suffering, and so we're going to talk about what we talked about yesterday. I'm going to ask Bucky some more questions about what I was thinking of it, how can I apply that to our lives, and our lives as we're working through suffering and all those different seasons. And we're just going to work through what we talked about yesterday. Well, good, Mary. Good to see you today. You too. Thanks for having me. And first of all, one of the things you mentioned as we went through it was kind of the different reasons and causes of suffering. You mentioned that it's a result of the fact that we live in a fallen world. It's a result of individual sin. And sometimes it's a result of suffering for righteousness sake. And so I wanted to ask you, as someone or as individuals, when we're going through seasons of suffering, how do we evaluate our suffering to know kind of what got us there and how to kind of suffer well in the midst of that evaluation? Well, that's a great question. You know, there's uh, and sometimes I lean on James 1 in that because it it ties into suffering. Uh, One, we always recognize that suffering's not an option. Sooner or later, somebody's going to deal with either some form of adversity through suffering, trials, or consequence. So what I like to do is to try to evaluate that is I first uh, remind myself, all right, I want to deal with self, examine myself. What's going on in my life? Uh, Is there unconfessed sin? Is there poor decision making? All those things and do that. Then get to the scripture and take the word of God because it's the mirror to our soul and really get in the word. And it's amazing to me that and this is one of the reasons I tell people you ought to be on a reading plan because usually that day I'm reading through something, it's pointing me to what God's doing in me. Mm-hmm. So I evaluate it uh, with self and then the scripture. And then I, I just look at, okay, all right, what's the enemy up to? Is mm-hmm. this a satanic attack? Uh, are those things that are in there? And And looking at those areas and evaluating it, and sometimes— I don't get clear answers in there, and sometimes I just realize this is going because of uh, one of the main reasons we suffer is we live in a fallen world. There's not really a cause and effect, but there is a response. Okay, God, how are you going to use it? Because he says he uses all things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so God, how are you going to use this in my life? So regardless of whether I can uh, discern the cause of suffering, I can develop an attitude of, just say, okay, Lord, how are you going to use this mm-hmm. and making it usable and constructive? Because again, uh, I said this yesterday, and God doesn't waste pain, but we do. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he's not causing pain in search of a purpose. He has a purpose, and sometimes he'll use that pain to get us there. But sometimes it's just the fact we live in a world that's just messed up. Mm-hmm. I think you said it yesterday, and you kind of touched on it then, but the purpose of our suffering is not, or the joy of our suffering is not in the pain, it's in the purpose. Right. And I think like you were saying, in kind of the focus of all the ways that you were talking about evaluate evaluating it was not looking more so at the suffering, but at the Lord and at His purposes in that suffering. And I feel like that's one thing that we always almost get wrong in the midst of those types of circumstances is that we're too consumed with our circumstance externally than our Savior and our Lord who can give us peace internally despite what's going on externally. That's really true. In Hebrews 12 tells us, fix your eyes on Jesus, Mm -hmm. the author and perfecter. That word perfecter means the mature, the grower. He's maturing us. And sometimes we see that word perfect and we think that means flawless. Mm -hmm. Uh, Scripture talks about the maturity of the believer. And so he's using that to mature me, but it's only going to work as long as I'm fixed on him, that Mm -hmm. my focus is on him and realize that bottom line is he's the cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, it really matters where my eyesight goes and my mind goes to, and it really is. Uh, and we're going to get into First Peter talking about the discipline of the mind mm. uh, and what's going on here. So, yeah, that's a great, great word, Mary, because it really does matter. That if if Jesus, if you're not getting His perspective, it's going to be tough to really get to the purpose He's working on. Right, because perspective really does change everything, and I think how we respond to our circumstances requires a right understanding of kind of 
who's orchestrating and who's in charge, and we know that the Lord is sovereign and that He has purposes that His will will prevail and all those things. So I think it's so important, like you said, perspective over where our eyes are fixed on is always so important that how we respond is a reflection of where our eyes and where our heart lies. Yeah. And so one of the things I was thinking about with we're trying to evaluate our suffering, but also where should our focus be amidst our suffering? And so one of the key, I guess, sufferers in the Bible that comes to my mind is Job. And I think you talked about him yesterday a lot. So when it comes to Job, his friends came and I would say probably had a bad evaluation of kind of the cause of his suffering, that it was something that he did wrong. And in Job's eyes, what he what was happening to him, there wasn't a just cause for it when he reflected back on his life. So if you're looking at Job, if you're looking at your own life, how do I evaluate what's going on? How, like Job, I guess, do we evaluate kind of some of the voices that aren't coming from the Lord that are speaking into our suffering and our circumstance in comparison to how can we have discernment and wisdom like Job to keep going back to the Father and to keep searching and to keep asking Him kind of how do I deal with what's going on in my life? Yeah, and because Job and God eventually had that hard conversation because mm-hmm. Job was going, hey, I don't think I've done anything. Right. You know, but at the same time, he never wavered in his trust for God. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he didn't He didn't keep him from asking God, what are you doing? Right. And I think that's where we start at. Sometimes we don't understand what God's done, and he's not put off with us asking. In other words, he's inviting us, seek me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of what suffering does. It turns our eyes to him to seek him in search of what it is. And there's always going to be these voices that, you know, there's always somebody that knows everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I kid people all the time. I wish I, when I was around 15 or 16 and I knew everything, I'd have wrote it down because now I don't know anything. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it's there's always somebody that wants to come in and evaluate it and say, you know, I've got this gift or that gift. I can discern your problem, that mm-hmm. problem. And the reality of it is uh, you have to put yourself on the throne to get there. Mm-hmm. And... In a culture, and you just in the application of it, because people maybe say, okay, suffering's great, big deal. How does that work in my life today? Well, one of the reasons we struggle with suffering in our culture is because we are so you-centered, me-centered. Mm-hmm. And so I've got to figure it out from my perspective. And what that does, it takes our eyes off Jesus. Mm-hmm. And just understanding that sometimes God intentionally and directly puts us into hard places. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about Peter, who wrote the book. Jesus said to him, Satan has desired to sit you, and I've given him permission. Mm-hmm. I mean, how would you like to be? Okay, and why would you do that? Why, God, would you give Satan permission to sift me? Right. And Jesus tells him, because when you have turned again, you will strengthen others. Mm-hmm. So sometimes God... Uh, it's not like he's just this passive aggressive dude that's sitting there waiting to show us who's boss. He intentionally puts us in hard places mm-hmm. to equip us to help others in hard places. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with seeking God and asking. And there's always going to be people out there. That's why you have to know the Word of God. You have to understand that. Hey, no, I've I've checked myself. I have examined myself. Mm-hmm. I've dealt, I've confessed unconfessed sin. I've done this. Only thing I can say is that God's doing a work and I'm going to trust him with it and I'm going to keep pressing in. When I don't know, that tells me I need to seek harder Mm -hmm. and trust God more. It's always an issue of trust and faith. I've got to press in because my mind can't figure it out. My body and my brain can't comprehend and my spirit is not enlightening me. The Holy Spirit is not enlightening me yet. So all that tells me is there's a need to press in, right. and that's what I've got to do. And I think it's when we lack to press in is when we almost get the most frustrated with it. And it's almost it's not even the circumstance or the suffering that what is what ends up being the most frustrating to us. It's the fact that we're not intentionally seeking and pressing into the Lord right. because it says that in Scripture we can have peace internally despite our external circumstances. And so if we're pressing in and we're seeking him and our eyes are set on him, it reminds me of when Peter and when Jesus was walking on water and Peter stepped out of the boat. And when his eyes were fixed on Jesus, despite the incredible circumstances that were around him, 
when his eyes were fixed on Jesus, he was walking on the water. And then when his eyes left Jesus and went to what was around him and his circumstance, that's when he started to struggle the most. And that's when Jesus reached in and grabbed him. But I think like you're saying, a lot of times if we're not intentionally seeking him and we're not setting our eyes on him, that's when we're going to be the most frustrated. And that's what's keeping our focus off of him because our circumstances are distracting us from where our eyes are meant to be regardless of what's going on in our lives. I think we really underestimate uh, how much God is working to conform us into his image and his nature, Mm -hmm. that it really matters to him and that he will put us in that furnace Mm -hmm. to take away all the dross, all the unnecessary stuff that does not reflect him. Mm -hmm. And so he will refine in order to get us to the place of the reflection that he wants. Mm -hmm. And I think we underestimate that. I think we underestimate how how much he wants us to be in that way. One, because it's the best thing to us. Two, because he desires glory from us, Mm -hmm. from his creation. I mean, that's what he says. You know, if you don't bring me praise, the rocks will cry out. So I think we underestimate. We always kind of have this conversation about how, you know, we're all uniquely made. Mm -hmm. And we are. Thank God we are uniquely made. Uh, But our problems aren't always just unique in the Mm -hmm. fact that, oh, you don't know what I'm going through because of this. Well, that may be the case, but here's what I do know, that God's working in me that I would be a reflection of his glory. So the, the purpose is pretty clear. And I think we underestimate how much he desires for us to reflect his glory in this life, in a world that is so hostile to him. And because that's what we're going to do for the rest of eternity, isn't it? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to be in the glory of the Lord. We're going to live in that glory. We're going, to, we're going to do everything we do. Our daily lives are all going to be in the glory of the Lord, uh, not just reflecting it, but being in that glory constant for eternity. Uh, so I think if we can understand that now in a world of hostility that doesn't want God to get glory, that's mm-hmm. ruled by Satan. Uh, but he's going to do that. That's what he's doing. It's everything he does in regards to suffering is with eternity in mind. We think about the here and now. He's thinking about mm-hmm. forever. And I think we underestimate that when we think about what, what God's going to do in the suffering and figuring out the cause and effect of it and all that kind of thing. And I think when you mentioned James in the very first chapter, it says count it all joy when you experience trials of various kinds. Yeah. And I think the more we recognize that it's refining us and it's making us look more like Jesus and it's bringing us closer to him because the things that are heaviest on our lives are what bring us to our knees before his throne most often. And so I think when we realize kind of the purpose behind what's going on and the things that as our weights get heavier, it brings us to his feet more often, that can be almost a joy to us because we know the purpose and we know the eternal weight of glory that's coming. And we know that it's refining us to make us more beautiful and more like him, which is ultimately what should be the object of our lives, whether we're in a good season or a bad season, is how can I use the circumstances that he's given me right now to ultimately look more like him as my life goes on in the day-to-day things. Well, you just think about it, Mary. Uh, in in life, uh, when do we tend to learn the most? In trials. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, nobody wants them. Right. But after we go through them, we're so thankful for them. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, uh, as I talked about Joseph Saul yesterday, the Romanian pastor, I mean, that, that quote where he said, 95% of Christians fail the test of prosperity but 95% of the Christians pass the test of adversity. Mm-hmm. Uh, we really don't handle prosperity well. Right. But God teaches us a great deal in adversity. And, you know, he listen, he's run this test over and over again. I mean, if there's a test group in Scripture, he's, he's, he's seen people prosper and put them in prosperity and want them to live there, mm-hmm. and they can't handle it. We can't. We struggle with handling prosperity. Right. So he, he has found— uh, and knows, I mean, it's not like he didn't know, he's, he's never at a loss, but that I I can get my purpose out of this adversity more than I will get it out of any type of prosperity, mm-hmm. and they'll remember it more. And so uh, suffering, and, and again, this I said this yesterday, when people say, well, if, why would a good God create suffering? Well, if you don't have God, how do you make sense of suffering? Mm-hmm. 
then it becomes useless. Right. You don't have a reason. You don't have this grand purpose that's going on in your life for suffering because you don't have a creator. You you just have this molecular combustion out there that you're going to turn back into the ground. So your suffering really is senseless. It doesn't make sense. But because I have a God who created me, loves me, redeemed me, there's a purpose to the suffering. It's not just senseless and useless. Mm -hmm. There is a purpose to it, and it's for his good that he's bringing it to, which comes to my good. So when he is glorified, I mean, I I am, that's where I'm my sweet spot. And so that's that's the thing about suffering that uh, the atheist would say, your God makes no sense. Well, having no God is even more senseless mm -hmm. in that regard. And that's even the title of the whole sermon, How to Make Sense of Suffering. Yeah. In the end, it's who orchestrates everything. It's who makes the sense of everything in our life for us. It's that we can look to Him. And if you don't have Him, then all you can look to is your circumstance and what's externally going on around you. Well, I mean, just look at it this way. I, I, I've lost family members and stuff. I mean, I, it was painful. My dad, uh, close friends, I've lost them. And uh, if there were no heaven and no eternity, it would it would just increase and intensify mm -hmm. the grief that I have. It, there's there's no hope to it. But because of Jesus, I mean, it still hurts. They're still grieving. We're separated by this veil of thing called death. But Jesus overcomes the grave. So I won't be eternally separated. I'll have eternity with them. And not only that, but I'll have a whole new family but and without strangers. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what Paul says in Romans that I talked about this yesterday, our time on earth is momentary. Our suffering here is momentary. It doesn't even compare to the eternal glory. Mm -hmm. And so we have to realize that this is such a brief time of our existence. Mm -hmm. I understand you don't make light of people who are in pain. I mean, they're in pain, and and we're called to come alongside them and help them encourage them because their pain is real. They're not making it up. And this is not to diminish or make light of the pain that comes in suffering. It's to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's the big issue. And I think uh, when Peter's writing this letter, uh, I, I thought about Peter when he's writing this letter because it's so it, it, at times it kind of gets comical. Because these folks are being persecuted. Nero is the emperor. I mean, he's setting Christians on fire. Mm -hmm. And then also blaming them for the fire that burned Rome when he actually did it. But, I mean, they're under intense persecution. And we're going to see this in Peter, but he doesn't change the standard. I mean, in the midst of persecution, he's going to tell them, hey, listen, you ought to take care of your marriage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, I know. Things are a little rough right now. You've been hunted down. Your cousin got burnt yesterday. How are you treating your wife? I mean, mm -hmm. it's that kind of like there's no there's no reason that you should not hold the standard of Christ. Mm -hmm. That regardless of circumstances, your best avenue, your best support, your best hope is to stay fixed on who Jesus is in your life. And that's the message of Peter, like you said in the storm, mm -hmm. you know. There was a big wave. That was no reason for him to take his eyes off Jesus. Right. And, you know, I'm glad you brought that up, too, about holding to your standard, because I think in talking about suffering, how do you evaluate it? How do you suffer well? I think it's also important to think about what are the things that you ought to guard against when you're suffering? What are some of the, the temptations that even if you're suffering for righteousness sake, like the people that Peter was writing to, they were suffering for the sake of Christ, because they did look different than the culture around them. I think it's so important to guard against this temptation of if I'm suffering and I feel isolated because I'm setting myself apart for the from the culture, how do I ensure and guard against the temptation to start going back into those old habits yes. so that I look more like the culture to avoid the suffering that I have right now for righteousness sake? Yeah. And remember, Peter knows exactly what that feels like. He does. Because yes. remember at the crucifixion when Jesus is being mm -hmm. interrogated, I mean, if you, I, I would say that if you sat down and interviewed Peter and you said, "Hey, Pete, when was the toughest time of your life?" He'd take us back to that night mm -hmm. when he had declared his loyalty to Jesus, and Jesus said, "Well, you're going to deny me three times." Right. And so, if anybody understands the pain of compromise, mm -hmm. 
Peter would be that guy. Yes. Because he remembers what it was. Uh, I think Luke talks about the fact that when he looked into the eyes of Jesus and he felt immense sorrow. Mm -hmm. if, if, if anyone understood compromise, it, he didn't learn it when he sank, mm -hmm. but I think he certainly learned it that night when he looked at Jesus and thought about, I was disloyal. Right. So he can speak to that. He can tell people, hey, listen, I'm telling you right now, the value of loyalty and fidelity and the heat of suffering, you don't want the pain of compromise. Mm -hmm. It's brutal. And I think you even mentioned it yesterday, when you're in the midst of suffering, why it's so important to bring other people around you for yes. their perspective. Because in Job's case, their perspective wasn't great. But in the case of everyone that Peter was writing to, they he spoke and gave them a perspective of someone that I've, like I've been through this before. It's what you mentioned in Luke, like you were sifted, but now you'll be able to strengthen people yeah. because of your struggle and because of the suffering that you've gone through. And so that's for us a reminder that when we're suffering, we don't want to isolate ourselves and not be honest and vulnerable about how we're feeling. Because even in Jesus, the night of his death and everything, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he doesn't isolate himself in his sorrow, but he brings people around him and tells them, I'm sorrowful unto death. He was very honest with the people that he surrounded himself with about how exactly how he was feeling amidst yeah. his suffering. Yeah. And I think that's important. Uh, that we don't isolate ourselves. Our tendency is when we're going through a hard time, we don't want to be around people. Mm -hmm. And of course, you, you don't. You don't want to sit there and just spew your pain all the time. Uh, but you do need people in your life that will come and intercede with you and pray for you and lift up your hands when they're growing weary. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our tendency is to uh, get into isolation or suppress things down where it's it, it's harsh and it gets heavy. Uh, now, you know, also talked about make, this, make sure they're well rested because Jesus took three people that fell asleep on him. So mm -hmm. if you're going to get intercessors, <laughs> make sure they got some energy to them. Right. Uh, but I, I found that interesting in that Jesus didn't try to isolate himself in his time of pain. He called three of his closest people, Peter, James, I need you to come pray for me. Mm -hmm. And again, Peter's there. So Peter understands the value of being there and not understanding the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's just important for us that we have people in our lives that help us. You know, first there's the perspective of it. I mean, because sometimes our perspective can get all messed up. Right. And and then just in the prayer that they're there to help us and pray for us and to lift up our hands when they're tough. I mean, they may not know any of the answers. Mm -hmm. The issue is not for them to know the answers or to give you clarity. The issue of them is to give you comfort and confidence in the fact that your Savior is still there. He's still your advocate. He has not left you. He has not forsaken you. He has not turned his back on you. Uh, he's still there. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes what we confuse is God's silence. We think his silence means that he's neglecting us. Mm -hmm. His silence may be his most powerful work in our life. Mm -hmm. And and so when you're in that suffering and it seems like all heaven is silent, keep pressing in because they're listening. Mm -hmm. And and God's listening. Uh, but you're in that place, and he knows exactly where you are. People often say to me, how can you be so sure that God knows exactly where I am? I said, because he counts the hair on your head. Mm -hmm. So if he's that interested in you, if he knows the number of hairs you have in your head, he knows exactly where you are and knows exactly what you're going through. Uh, so understand that. The question is not does God know where I am. Am I sure that I've got where God is? Right. Is God on the throne of my life? Or if I got stuff in my life obstructing? Or what is he preparing me for? Mm -hmm. This is not the place I'm coming to. It's the place I'm going through. So where is he leading me? Mm -hmm. And I can look back on my life and say that the times of suffering have prepared me for the next place of service. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't like it. Uh, but once you get in that service, man, you feel so much better equipped for it. And so I, I just think I don't always handle suffering well, Mary. I'm not sitting here saying, man, I, I never freak out at suffering. Now, there are times, I, I mean, I can get in there and say, God, hey, listen, i I, I've been doing this for a while. I think I've earned a free pass here, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because we think that way. We think, hey, listen, I've been with you for a long time now. I haven't forsaken you. I mean, I mean there have been there have been times 
you know, we get that really good loss of memory, mm-hmm. <laughs> that good timing. <laughs> right. And, and so, but he's he's working on me until he's finished. That's what Philippians says. Mm-hmm. I started this work in you. I'm going to keep working until I complete it. Mm-hmm. So the fact that I'm still alive on earth means he's still working to complete something in me. Mm-hmm. And I may not like the way it feels in shaping me, but here's what I trust. He knows what he's doing, and he's doing it for his glory and my good. Right. So I can trust it. And I think as we look, because we look to Jesus as our example for everything, and in the same way we look to see how he surrounded himself with community We look to see how he brought his suffering to the Lord and how he trusted him with that. And he says, if it like if you could take this cup from me, he expressed his honest petition. But then after that he said, But not what my will, but your will be done. And even the Son of God, Jesus, who we're meant to emulate, he knew exactly what he needed to do amidst his suffering. And he said, Not my will, but your will be done. He knew that there was greater purpose that even for him, his suffering was the kind of means to his service for all mankind, and that was going to the cross. And so I think if we're trying, Jesus is who we ought to emulate everything for, and even in suffering when we're seeking to suffer well and to suffer in a way that would honor him and while also being honest with ourselves but also being honoring to him. If we look to Jesus, he again, once again, gives us the perfect example of how we ought to suffer well and how our suffering can honor him the most. And think about it, Mary, and, and I know we probably got to start wrapping stuff up here, but think about it. Here's Jesus. Uh, he knows the whole world. He, he's got to go to the cross. Mm-hmm. But in, in the humanity, because he's all, he's all human now, because he's got to do this as a human, in the harshest time right before where he knows he's destined to go, he says, God, if you got another way, I'm good with it. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think we do that in our suffering. I mean, I'm, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm praying that all the time. Hey, God, listen, okay, I trust you, but if there's a better way to do this mm-hmm. that's not painful, right? That I can learn in some other way that you can be satisfied by some other level, I'm good with that. And I think that's what Jesus helps us understand is the fact his father was not offended that he said, "Hey, if there's another way." Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to go all hero here. Right. There, there, I mean, now, God's going to make that decision. And of course, it was what it had to be. But Jesus, did, that didn't keep Jesus from saying, hey, Father, this is going to be really hard. And if you can do something else in another way that doesn't take what this is going to take, I'm good. But if you can't, I'm all in. Right. I think that's where we got to be. Absolutely. Nobody wants the suffering that comes with the cross. But sometimes that's the only suffering that will take place. Mm -hmm. And I think, and even then we understand that God's in it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we've got to realize. And so, again, it goes back to that same fact. Without God, there is no sense of suffering. Right. It doesn't make sense. Absolutely. There is no divine plan. There is no eternal cause. There is no redemptive story to write. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're suffering, you're suffering. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense. Right. I mean, you can say, you know, well, I missed the nail and hit my thumb and say that's the cause and that's effect. But, I mean, you don't have any, there's no grand design there. There's no great purpose. And I, I just really think that sometimes we need to think as believers, hey, God's got a grand plan that he's made me a part of. And so I just need to trust him because he sees it all at once. I see it in this moment. He sees it from everlasting to everlasting. And I got to trust him based on his sight and his perception. Yes, absolutely. So like you said, we do probably need to wrap up a little bit. But this is the first of many sermon recaps that we're going to start doing. And we're going through 1 Peter. So as we keep going, is there anything that we should look out for as we continue through 1 Peter? Well, next week, we're going to talk about a lot about position. If you're not positioned right, you're going to have a hard time understanding what's going on. And and sometimes you really need to understand our position in Christ and identity. You say a lot of stuff because he talks about that. And then we're going to talk. He talks about the mindset that we're to have. But then he gets into... What we also talk about the, this whole deal of we are a community, that we're blocks on blocks and built on one another and everybody's got a role. And, but then it's just this issue of how Peter, in the midst of this great turmoil, refuses to compromise. Mm-hmm. 
And, and remember, he understands compromise. And I think he, if we lose that context and backdrop that who Peter is, that he's he's the one that betrayed Jesus at, at that dark hour. So he he's not talking about what he doesn't know about, and he's not talking about it from the fact that he always got it right, mm-hmm. which is something that matters. But because of that, he knows the pain of not getting it right mm-hmm. and the fact that he is going to hold this standard regardless of the circumstances you're under. Because sometimes what we do is we go through suffering and we think the pain gives us the right to act ungodly or less than righteous. Mm -hmm. And what Peter's saying, no, I'm going to hold you to it. And because that's who we are and that's who he is. So uh, it is a fascinating, that those five chapters, I mean, what he does there. And so uh, we're going to get to know old Pete there a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a good read. Sounds like we have a lot to learn. We'll have a lot to talk about. (laughs) Oh, yeah. But thank you all for tuning in with us today. Join us next week for another sermon recap, and we look forward to getting to talk more about 1 Peter. For more content like today's podcast, click right here. For sermons, click right here. And again, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Have a blessed day.